Uh, good afternoon and uh, first of all I want to say that I'm really grateful for the opportunity to speak to you um, this afternoon and to ask for a bit of tolerance from the start because uh, unlike all of you I'm not a cybersecurity expert, I'm a lawyer so if my language slips a bit and I get something a wee bit wrong I want you just to be a, a bit forgiving. Um, it was through our connection in the cybersecurity cluster that we were asked to speak today and Judith kindly suggested my title for me of legal and ethical challenges in cybersecurity. Like all good lawyers, I'm going to focus more on the legal and less on the ethical, but um, the, the ethical aspects will be in, in, in there as well. Now, my role, I am actually the uh, Director of Operations and Compliance within Carson McDowell. Carson McDowell is a local Belfast-based law firm, and we're the largest independent law firm in Belfast. Um, my role as Director of Operations means that I have an oversight over the whole firm. So I see what all our different lawyers are doing in the cyberspace, be that uh, property lawyers, be that our employment lawyers, our IP specialists, um, through to our corporate and commercial guys doing their mergers and acquisitions. And what I did to prepare for today was I sort of spoke to all of them about what they see as the legal challenges. And that's what I thought I would give you. Um, it's not an in-depth legal lecture, um, but rather a whistle-stop tour of what we at Carson McDowell see as the real challenges to hit the sector at the moment. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the legal landscape. I'm going to talk to you a bit about intellectual property because that's something that keeps coming up. And actually, even while I've been here today, I think I've had three intellectual property discussions while I've been here. I'm going to talk to you generally about tort, you know, our civil wrongs and how that fits into cybersecurity. I'm going to talk about public confidence and privacy. I've been hearing that message coming out um, a lot today. And then I'm going to talk to you finally a little bit about future regulation and what I think might be coming down the track or what I think should be coming down the track in this particular sector. So when we look at the current legal landscape, um, John Murr sort of apologised for saying the words earlier on, but I'm going to just come straight out and talk to you about Brexit because on our legal landscape, Brexit is a major challenge. Now, it feels at the minute like we're having a bit of a Brexit reprieve, but we're not really, because it's only until Halloween, and it's not really very far away. So if um, we exit the EU um, with a deal in place, then for 2019 and most of 2020, everything will remain as it is. Um, for those of you who don't follow the sort of legal side of the Brexit argument, we do have a Supremacy Act passed, which means that any European regulations currently in force will remain in force, uh, whether we exit with a deal or with the out a deal. But if we exit with the out a deal, there are going to be all sorts of problems within your sector, as I see it. So that could be whether there's divergence in how GDPR is applied within the UK and outside of the UK, the NIS regs, which I'm going to talk a bit about in a minute. It could be database rights or free movement of goods and services, whether you need to have a European representative. Those are all things that you should be planning for now. And people I know are naturally reticent until we know exactly what's happening. We don't want to put a plan in place. But when we know exactly what's happening, it's going to be too late. So you still need to be planning for that now. Now, the major focus last year in the legal landscape was all about GDPR, wasn't it? And I think everybody almost became a bit GDPR overwhelmed um, uh, and there was too much discussion about GDPR almost. But one thing that I wanted to highlight for you within GDPR, it does introduce this new privacy framework. And generally, I think it is starting to bed in well and to work well. But remember this, it took four years from the first draft till the legislation came into force. And that's a challenge. So where it takes four years to agree that sort of privacy framework and get it into a workable format, that's too slow for your sector from what I can say. So I just wanted to mention that on GDPR. I'm not going to go on about GDPR today. But I did want to mention the uh, NIS regs. I don't know if anybody else has mentioned them over the past couple of days. But I think they almost became overshadowed by GDPR. But where we did have the cybersecurity directive came into force in the UK in the network information security regulations uh, on the 10th of May last year. And really what that was was the first legislative recognition of the importance of our networks. You know, that networks are vital to our society for um, electricity, communication, health, transport, everything. And that that needed a higher level of protection and a higher standard of regulation. 
Um, I mean, I've heard people mention it today. We all know about the problems with the NHS and even things that happened with the WannaCry attack, you know, around diagnostic machines that you know, couldn't be patched and, um, you know, uh, therefore were vulnerable and stopped appointments taking place. So the NIS regs really try to identify that there are essential services within our society and they need additional um, regulation. It also applies to um, people who are uh, you know, providers of um, online marketplaces or cloud-based um, search engines as uh, you know, important um, uh, internet providers. They're too, the, system, the regulations themselves aren't straightforward and their application is even more complicated again because it depends what sector you're working in. So each sector has got its own individual guidelines. And so if you were providing um, services to a client within the energy sector, you'd have to look at their specific guidelines. If you're one of the um, uh, relevant internet providers, then you would need to look to the information commissioner's office. And they actually have got really good guidelines and they've got like a really nice checklist that you can download for free and use and it'll take you through compliance. But a challenge within the NIS regs, as it sits even with GDPR, is that it leads to almost a system of double jeopardy. So if you imagine um, if you were, I don't know, working for a client or involved in uh, cybersecurity within a transport sector client and um, they had a breach, they had a cyber attack and they report it quite correctly under NIS regs to their sector-based um, uh, authority. If it then turns out that um, there was, a, I don't know, a customer database taken during the course of that hack. That also needs to be reported under GDPR to the ICO. Now, both those systems of regulations carry the potential for enforcement of up to 17 million. And that means a potential for two fines of up to 17 million. And uh, the government were asked at the time during the consultation periods for both pieces of regulation whether that meant we were having a system of double fines. And they said, well, it would be very rare circumstances where fines in both uh, enforcement action and both regulations would take place. But sometimes the nature of the wrongdoing means that fines in both would be justified. So it's a deliberate intention because of the seriousness and the importance. Now, the other major development on the legal landscape as I see it at the moment is we've got the Cyber Security Act. Has anybody else talked about this, this over the last couple of days? So the Cyber Security Act has just come into force and that really is um, brought in through the European Commission to give a permanent mandate for the EU Cyber Security Agency. So really the intention behind that piece of legislation is to give uh, more teeth to a single stop shop across Europe um, on cyber security. So that's a change that we need to um, uh, pay note of as well. When I looked at all the legislation and the regulation, what I really wanted to say to you and what I really wanted to point out was that there's a lot happening within this space. There's a lot of developments taking place. We've had the slow period of GDPR, and I think it was John Murray also mentioned this morning, um, the intention to fast track. So we've got the voluntary code of practice for IoT devices now, but the government have announced that they're gonna fast track that into legislation. So they're trying to move quickly with that. There's a lot of regulation and it is um, something that you have to keep track of and it'll be, be it difficult as that is. On the positive side, because I always like to see where there's a challenge, I think there's a positive side as well. So on the positive side, what I did notice as I was looking through the sort of regulation and legislative framework is that we've gone from the sort of prescriptive legislation that would have been um, in my past to the a more principle-based type of legislation and if you look, for example, in the NIS regs and GDPR on how they talk about security, you know, we're now not looking at a prescriptive security standard, but we're looking at what's appropriate, what's proportionate, what the state of, art, of the art offers, so what's available within the market. And I think that is a better system of regulation. So I do think whilst there are challenges, there are positives moving forward as well. Then the next thing I wanted to mention to you was a little bit about intellectual property. Now, within our firm, we haven't acted for um, a cybersecurity company in relation to uh, IP rights surrounding one of their products. We act routinely for software providers um, in disputes about their products. And the laws that currently stands and applies within the UK is really based on the idea of a human author. 
And to me, that's the challenge that I see coming down the track. So a lot of the cyber products that we see um, coming to market involve some sort of machine learning, some sort of automated uh, AI involved in it. And if there's not a human author, then I think our law is not well equipped to deal with who is the owner of the outworkings, particularly if you put a, you know, a system in and the purchaser, the client that buys the product, then has a period of time to test and learn and, and, and get the system to learn to do what they want it to do. Who owns the outworkings of that sort of situation? Um, throughout the room and the breakout sessions today when I've been talking to people, um, a couple of things have come to mind. So one uh, guy was talking to me over lunchtime about their product that they use, um, and they've developed it through a collaboration, and um, they don't claim any IP rights over the product. The collaboration, they believe they'll all work together. Now, to me, that seems the wrong way around. Um, I, what I would be saying to you in practical terms, and even um, you know, the, the collaborations with academics as well as with business, Everybody seems to be saying within this group that collaboration is the way forward, and that's great. But when it comes to intellectual property, you have to have a full and frank discussion up front, not after the fact. It needs to be done first. And I think um, whenever we mentioned a moment ago, people were saying, well, after the fact, whenever your product is massively successful and uh, there's a need for it, then you come to the lawyers to find out who owns which aspects, and that is too late. We need to be involved at the start so we can help you with contracts and agreements to make sure that we've agreed those IP rights right from the start. The other thing on the flip side um, that occurred to me as we see uh, you know, with cybersecurity products is the infringement of intellectual property rights. So we are seeing some products coming in that use data mining or text mining to test for vulnerabilities within systems. And that's a concern for us because they can be infringing um, intellectual property rights in the UK, we've got an exemption if you're doing that for non-commercial purposes, but if you're selling that product or that service to a commercial company, then that's a commercial purpose and you're not covered by that exemption. Now, there has been um, uh, the Cybersecurity Act that I mentioned does give us further exemptions on that, but we're yet to see any case law about how that's going to be applied, so it's very much watch this space. In terms of tort and civil liability, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the law of tort and how it applies. Um, and I was thinking in particular, starting off with the idea of negligence, and I've heard a couple of the speakers use the word negligence. And negligence, obviously, to me, has a very specific legal meaning. So when I'm talking about the law of negligence, I'm looking at whether there's a duty of care, whether there's been a breach of that duty, whether the loss was foreseeable, and whether um, the, there's a causal link between the breach that happened and the loss which occurred. Now, it might be of interest to you, it might not, but I'll try it anyway. The law in this area comes from a leading case um, of Donoghue and Stevens about a lady who was out for afternoon tea with her friends, and she had a bottle of ginger beer, and when she got to the end of the bottle, there was a decomposing snail within the bottle, and she took ill as a result. And there was a whole sort of legal debacle about whether the people who manufactured the beer were responsible, the company, that, the, the cafe that served it to her, or whether, um, you know, whether there was no link at all. And um, they, law, they looked in particular about whether there was, a, you know, who your neighbour was. So the, the Lord, Lord Aiken, who gave uh, the leading judgment in the case, stated that the rule that you are to love your neighbour becomes in law that you must not injure your neighbour. And lawyers question, who is my neighbour? And they receive a restricted reply. The answer seems to be persons who are so closely and directly affected by my act that I ought reasonably to have them in contemplation as being so affected. Now, it was that bit that I wanted to highlight to you, because when I hear you guys talk about interconnected, um, un un unbundled, was that the term we were using? Unbundled products. So where the infinite outworkings of the technology that you're developing, who is within your contemplation as being affected by the product that you're designing? So where does your duty of care lie and end? I mean, if we take the laws that currently stands and apply it easily um, in a negligence case against a doctor, so a doctor provides surgery to a patient, they clearly have a duty of care to that patient. The surgery is performed negligently, they're in breach of that duty of care. It's foreseeable that the patient would suffer harm, and the patient suffers harm as a result of the surgery. That's easy. But if we then change that situation where we have a doctor working with um, a robot with cognitive abilities during the surgery, does the supplier of the robot have a duty of care to the patient? It's certainly foreseeable that it's going to be used um, on individuals. Do they have a duty of care? 
if something goes wrong and it's an unexpected outcome, is that foreseeable? If there's a network failure, where does the causal link come in? If there's a cyber attack, who's responsible in that situation and where does the, uh, the, the causal link all flow? So you can see that the point that I'm raising is that the legal principles are still good. They can be applied to the world that you work in, but they really come from an age where life was a bit more simple and ladies went for afternoon tea and drank ginger beer. So uh, I think that we are going to get more case law. And in fact, I think there'll be an abundance of case law within this area. Part of the problem that we see at the minute is that a lot of the cases um, are being settled and we're not seeing legal principles. But when we were talking about this in the office, we were saying, well, there is an ability, and certainly within the UK, judges have an ability, even if someone wants to settle the damages side of the case, they have an ability to push the case on to a public hearing because there's a public interest in the case being dealt with publicly so that we have a precedent to work from. And I can see, I can certainly imagine one of our judges in Belfast would love that opportunity to have a leading case. Um, and given the growth of cyber here, you, of, of the whole technology sector here, you could see that happening. Um, there is an interesting European Commission working document on key legal issues within the Internet of Things that talks about the, 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 the interconnection of devices and how legal liability will flow from that um, within tort, but that's a, a, a sort of um, a different type of issue. In fact, what that made me think about, when we talk about our internet of things and all our interconnected devices, it made me think of, um, and John, you'll keep me right if I'm wrong here, it made me think of the case of Rylands and Fletcher and the escape of a dangerous thing. So in tort, in civil law, there's case law that says, if you have something and it started off with land. So if you've, it, somebody had uh, water on their land and it escaped onto someone else's land that caused damage, they were responsible for the escape of that water that caused harm. But if we apply that within cybersecurity, um, if you have, uh, say, an ethical hacker, I don't know, who tests something in a test environment and that escapes and causes an impact in the live environment, they're then responsible for the escape of that dangerous thing. Or you could look at even um, when we were talking in our breakout session about um, interconnected, uh, about autonomous cars and how um, the one car can communicate to another in a way that wasn't anticipated. Is that an escape of a dangerous thing from one vehicle to another? So I think we can see um, legal developments really coming quite thick and fast in this area. That's the challenge, the positive. Um, that our lawyers are saying at the minute is that they can manage these risks for you through clear instructions, clear communication, clear understanding. So really being transparent and understanding what's anticipated, what the anticipated uses of your product are, what the anticipated uses aren't, and really trying to manage those risks for you until the law in this area becomes clearer. Now, would you believe there is no tort of invasion of privacy within the UK? So there's no civil wrong. You wouldn't believe it if you read any newspaper. There's no civil wrong of invasion of privacy. But um, there is a right to private and family life under the European Convention. Um, and we do have a tort of misuse of private information. Now, it seems to me that these two, between the tort and the public confidence, they merge into one. Because for whatever reason, and they all haven't heard uh, Peter Davies talk otherwise, nobody would be talking about privacy and they'd all be talking about safety. But the public interest has really been gauged around privacy and how, um, as technology advances, privacy is the relevant factor. So we don't have, um, as I say, a tort of invasion of privacy, but we do have the tort of misuse of private information. So that law really focuses on whether... Um, the information that's used is private. Is it obviously private? Um, does it have the necessary, uh, necessary elements of confidence about it? And uh, is it used in a way which wasn't intended? But you'll have heard before of the much publicized target case, you know, the target case in America, so where they ran the algorithms on the ladies' shopping um, choices. And so her shop shopping choices obviously weren't private. But they identified that she was pregnant as a result and um, sent you know, some complimentary gifts to her house. She was indeed pregnant, but she was a schoolgirl and her parents didn't know she was pregnant and literally only found out she was pregnant whenever Target sent the stuff to her home. So although the information wasn't private, the use of it was intrusive. So I think, again, you know, that's a challenge where we've got the law saying one thing and the ability to use non-private information to give us a very private result. 
In fact, I think if you went into any coffee shop around Belfast today, people are talking about whether their information, which may not be all that private, being collected through all the sensors and the interconnected devices that they have at home is being used in a non-private way. In fact, you only have to look on the internet every day and you'll see a new story. And I think this morning's was about you know, the use of children's data and um, you know, it, that being recorded in a way that parents couldn't access or control through your, you, you know, your assistant in the house. So I think that that privacy topic needs more discussion um, and you know, where we see that increase in uh, interconnected devices, uh, we do have a wealth of concerns there um, and we just have to deal with those as they come up. Now, when I spoke to our lawyers in the office, I was tried, someone tried to convince me, and I'm yet to be convinced, but again, I'll try it on you and you can see how you, you, can get, on, how you get on with it, that the answer is informed consent. So the answer to the privacy concerns is an argument of informed consent, much as you have in medicine, you know, where you are obliged to tell people of the risks. They then balance the risks and they make a decision whether to go ahead. Now, the reason that I'm not convinced that informed consent is the answer is because of my GDPR experience and I've seen this click-through culture that we've got. So even if you try to be really upfront about what you're doing with people's information, they're click-through because they want to get to the end result and that's not really, um, they're not really in a position to, um, get an, uh, to give you informed consent. So we have the current voluntary code of practice and the um, government are now saying that that's going to move into a statutory, uh, onto a statutory basis where you have to have almost like a consumer protection law on interconnected devices. So you're going to have to have a labelling system. And I think, again, sorry, anybody who wasn't in the same breakout session as me, we were talking about you know, the five-star rating for the automated car. So you could tell what tests it's been through, what it's done, what it hasn't done. That the same will be on all your IoT devices, that there'll be a labelling system so that people can easily understand what the device is going to do and what it's not going to do. But I'm still not convinced that that would give you a, a, a strong argument argument that someone has truly understood and freely given their consent, you know, having balanced the risks and the benefits properly. Just another um, challenge that I see coming down the track. As we talked um, in some of the breakout sessions and again um, within the public confidence, the issue not just of privacy but of actual physical security has to be a greater concern. Um, you, you're seeing more and more, I suppose, in our smart homes, we've even got those situations where we have like a lock that unlocks when you come within five meters with your iPhone or your, whatever your, your phone is. Um, so where we're putting people's physical security at risk, this is my nod to the ethical arguments, surely there has to be an obligation on um, the, the sector as you're developing products to ensure that you're avoiding harm is that not got to be the starting point of the, the, the design process? And that you're designing products to prevent unintended or unexpected behavior. Um, we could look at liability currently, if something goes wrong, I've already talked about the law of tort and civil liability, but we could look at criminal liability as well um, if we were looking at, I don't know, someone was mentioning earlier, um, you know, the, the, the Chrysler Jeep, attack and the, the way that that worked and if that had not been done as a deliberate experiment but had been done that someone suffered actual harm could there be um, criminal liability as a result or if they had overlooked that and not recalled those vehicles and that's definitely um, something that uh, we should take into mind. And the final thing that I wanted to mention to you is about future regulation and really where I see things going. I've already said that the government are very keen on making us uh, making the UK a global leader in uh, safety for IoT devices and in cybersecurity. And we are pushing forward the proposed legislation um, to introduce this new labelling system. Um, but the point that I'm interested in, so in, in part of my job, I have over the years worked with a lot of doctors, dentists, uh, social workers, nurses, who've appeared before their regulator because of a breach of professional practice. Now, it occurs to me that given the importance of the work you guys are doing, surely there has to be an independent system of professional regulation, rather than regulation of systems and regulations of devices, but regulation of individuals. Um, again, um, Peter was talking about catastrophic events. He was talking about 
population extinction. Um, and the, that has caused me such great concern that I am now about to start a one woman campaign to ensure there's greater regulation in the sector. Because if you feed that back into what people were saying earlier on in the day about um, vulnerability reporting, integrity in what you report about what you know, saying what your product can do, and then the possibility of catastrophic events being the outworking of not reporting properly, surely there must be a system of independent regulation so that um, people can have confidence in um, cybersecurity, people can have confidence in the professionals that they engage, and I would allow all of you as leading experts to lead the way and to actually have you know, a system that you could uh, be proud of and a regulation that you could uh, lead the way in rather than the charlatans who are you know, misleading people and not disclosing what they need to disclose. So on that happy thought, I'm uh, going to leave you, so thank you very much. <laughs>